And good evening. Biden's red line. As we come on the air tonight, President Biden and heads of states from around the world are in Brussels, urgently searching for a way to bring Putin's month-long war in Ukraine to an end. The leaders gathering in person for an emergency summit at NATO headquarters, putting a, on a united front, signaling to Russia that they are strong and ready to take action. But the president is making headlines tonight for drawing a red line with Russia, warning if Putin uses chemical weapons, the U.S. will be forced to respond. The president also handing down new sanctions. The tense moments when reporters asked if there would be enough to deter Russia. Earlier, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressing the summit virtually, again pleading for the U.S. and NATO to do more. Zelensky warning of the consequences of inaction and what could happen from there, saying Russia does not intend to stop in Ukraine. It wants to go further. As talks continue, Ukrainian forces are doing their best to hold off that Russian advance, claiming to have destroyed a Russian warship. Those images in a moment. But first, Kristen Welker leading us off from Brussels. After warning Vladimir Putin may use chemical and biological weapons in Ukraine, tonight President Biden at an emergency NATO summit declaring the U.S. will take action if there's a chemical attack. We would respond if he uses it. The nature of the response would depend on the nature of the use. But when pressed, still no specifics on whether military force is on the table. It would trigger a response in kind, whether or not you're asking whether NATO would cross We'd make that decision at the time. The president saying this summit with leaders of NATO, the G7, and the EU is sending an unmistakable message to Putin. He didn't think we could sustain this cohesion. NATO has never, never been more united than it is today. Putin is getting exactly the opposite what he intended to have. Mr. Biden and NATO announcing new penalties against Russia, including new sanctions on Russian lawmakers and a billion dollars in humanitarian aid for Ukraine. That money a part of recently approved funds. But Ukraine's President Zelensky speaking by video to the summit was sharply critical of the U.S. and NATO for not doing more, saying Ukrainians are dying and NATO, quote, has yet to show what it can do to save people, pleading for tanks, fighter jets, and a no-fly zone. Zelensky saying Ukraine is waiting for real actions. Meanwhile, Mr. Biden saying he will push for Russia to be removed from the group of major economies known as the G20, and that so far China, which like much of Europe still buys Russian oil and gas, has not given Russia more military aid. China understands that uh, its economic future is much more closely tied to the West uh, than it is to Russia. And so uh, I, uh, I, I'm hopeful that he, uh, he does not get engaged. So far, the U.S. and NATO allies have unleashed significant sanctions against Russia for the invasion. But those penalties have not deterred Putin, something the White House and Vice President Harris initially said was the goal. The purpose of the sanctions has always been and continues to be deterrence. But today, the president bristling when asked if that strategy was not working. I did not say that, in fact, the sanctions would deter him. Sanctions never deter. You keep talking about that. Sanctions never deter. The maintenance of sanctions, the maintenance of sanctions, the increasing the pain, that's what will stop him. And joins us now from Brussels. Kristen, you know, you point out there pretty thoroughly in your piece how the vice president and the president don't seem to be on the same page when it comes to sanctions. But ultimately, what does the Biden administration say their ultimate goal is in terms of those sanctions? Well, President Biden was quite defensive today, Tom, and you're absolutely right. Initially, the vice president and other top officials within the Biden administration said that the point of sanctions was deterrence. And now that has changed. The president on down say the point is to really try to stop Putin. They say that's why they've rolled them out in these tranches. But here's the challenge, Tom. They have rolled out several rounds of sanctions, sharp, biting sanctions against Vladimir Putin, his inner circle, Russia's largest financial institutions, and that has yet to deter Putin. And so the question is, what will? Because clearly so far, the sanctions have not stopped him or his invasion, Tom. You know, some Ukrainian leaders are talking about how the president mentioned sort of this red line with chemical weapons and how they're, they're a little upset over that, right? Because why are some weapons okay and other weapons are not? Do, do we get a sense of what would happen if Vladimir Putin uses chemical weapons? 
That is the big unknown. Today, President Biden was pressed on that over and over again. What would happen if Putin uses chemical weapons? President Biden was very clear. He warned there would be action. He said that the U.S. and NATO would respond in kind. But, Tom, he was pressed repeatedly and would not give specifics about what those repercussions would look like. Would they include military action? And of course, so far, the president has been very clear he does not want to escalate this crisis. That is why he's been opposed to a no-fly zone. So the question is, has he made it clear to Vladimir Putin what the repercussions would be? That question remains unanswered. And again, President Zelensky of Ukraine has asked for a range of military aid that the U.S. and its NATO allies have not granted yet. They say that could potentially escalate this crisis into World War III, and they don't want to do that. Tom. Kristen Welker leading us off tonight from Brussels. Kristen, thank you. As NATO leaders meet in Brussels, the toll of this month-long war, inescapable in the besieged city of Mariupol, deserted streets, bombed-out apartment buildings, and tens of thousands of residents with no way out. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel reports again from Ukraine. Russia has by now all but flattened Mariupol. New images released by officials in Mariupol show the once thriving port city has been devastated by Russian bombs. Ukrainian officials say 100,000 people remain in Mariupol and they're cut off without food or water. U.S. military officials say Russia is now concentrating its assault on the east of Ukraine around Mariupol, close to the Russian border. Russia has begun to resupply its troops there. Russian television showing the arrival of a landing ship in a port on the Sea of Azov, with fighting vehicles unloaded and readied for battle. Today, Russia's plans took a turn. The ship was in flames. Ukrainian forces claim they destroyed it this morning and damaged two other Russian vessels. Russia's new focus on the east may be out of duress. Ukrainian forces are making advances around Kyiv, pushing back Russian troops from the capital. But Russia's air bombardment hasn't stopped. <sighs> Victoria, 66 and retired, was in her apartment when a Russian missile exploded outside her window, shards of glass cutting her all over. We filmed where the missile landed, in the center of Victoria's housing complex, damaging a nearby school and grocery. There were no military targets here. Victoria says she has panic attacks when she thinks about that day. Her wish, the evildoers must be punished, she says. Tom, it was exactly a month ago that the air raid sirens first rang out here in Kyiv, and they are still ringing out every single day. And based on how Russia is consolidating its forces, it seems clear that Vladimir Putin has decided to embark on a long war of attrition. The Ukrainians have an advantage. They're fighting for their homes. They have a lot of fighting spirit. They're getting weapons in from NATO. But even with that factored in, Russia maintains an overwhelming majority when it comes to troops and weapons. Tom. Richard Engel again for us tonight from Kyiv. Richard, thank you. With the U.S. and NATO pledging more aid to Ukraine one month into this war, I want to check in with someone who's been on Top Story a couple of times now, Kira Ruddick. She's a member of Ukraine's parliament and a leader of the Golos Party. She's also taken up arms and joined the fight for her country. Kira, thank you so much for joining Top Story tonight. I know this is an incredibly stressful time for you. We talked a few weeks ago when I was in Ukraine. You were telling us how you were training with an AK-47. First, how are you doing? It's been a month of war. And what does your day-to-day -day life look like right now? Hello, thank you so much for having me. So after a month of war, the main frustration that we feel right now and that I as a politician and uh, just Ukrainian citizen feel right now is that on day 30, we are asking our partners for the same thing that on day one. And I'm thinking, like, was, uh, the, uh, was our bravery not enough to get the support for to close our skies and to get an offline zone? Was our frustration and uh, the horror that we are going through not enough so we would get uh, the help that we need? Like, or what is going on? And uh, because I can tell you how the daily life looks like. We are training and we are uh, getting stronger and stronger every day.
My resistance team is uh, showing great results and we are interacting with uh, the general resistance. I'm much better with uh, the AK than uh, I was before. We are getting ready for a siege and we have enough of storage of food and water and supplies. But there is absolutely nothing that we can do with the threat that is coming from the air, with the missiles and bombs that are coming from, from Russia. And uh, for the last couple of days, it, it has been intensified a lot here in Kiev. Kira, you know, we heard from NATO Secretary General tonight who defended NATO's actions so far. President Biden has pledged a billion dollars in humanitarian aid that they will take in 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. They did say today chemical weapons were going to be sort of a red line. They, 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 would, they would have to reassess and maybe get involved if that happens. Is that enough for you? No, it's not enough. I think children dying of dehydration in the country, in the center of Europe, is already a red line. I think siege where people are starved out is already a red line. So are you putting a red line on a type of death that people are facing? So it's okay to die of hunger right now and not okay to die of a chemical attack? So this makes me so, so, so uh, angry and upset. There are many ways for us to get the jets, to get the additional weaponry, to be able to protect ourselves from the air. So you saying that, uh, and NATO are saying that it is okay to be killed by missile, but would not be okay to be killed by biological weapon. Is it like something that people can judge on? This is absolutely frustrating. Uh, Kira, I, I understand your frustration, and, and, and I also understand how it, it, for someone like you and the rest of the people in Ukraine, it makes absolutely no sense that some weapons are okay and other weapons are not, and that NATO calculation doesn't really add up in your mind. I completely understand that. But you guys are still incredibly courageous, still willing to fight. What is the morale of Ukrainians? Because I, I, I hear sort of a change in your tone, and I get it because we see the video from Maripol, and it is just heartbreaking. But your fellow citizens that you talk to every day, we see them in interviews back here in the United States. But what's it like to be there and to talk to them? What are you hearing? So people's morale is still very high, especially that on the ground we are giving Russian army hell. We are fighting them back. We uh, are taking uh, small cities back that were occupied. And we know that if we get even the minor support in the air, we will be able to push them back farther and farther. And uh, Russian army was not ready to the resistance that they faced here in Ukraine. And this and every small and large victory that we are having, it makes us uh, stronger and more motivated. Like one of the Russian warships that was destroyed today, like continuous destruction of Russian airplanes uh, and uh, um, the airdrome of Chernobylka. There are many, many great uh, stories about victory uh, local and global that we are doing every single day. And it makes my people so proud. But as a leader, as a politician, I need to make sure that, that this war will come to an end. Um, we need to make sure that at some point we are able not just fight them locally, but to push them back to uh, make sure that we stop having this neighbor who always wants to destroy us in and in the best of Nazi ideology saying that they need, uh, that they uh, actually deny Ukrainians the right to live. Kira Rudik, a member of Ukraine's parliament for us tonight. Kira, we always thank you. We know it is a stressful time for you and your people. All right, there is also concerns tonight over a missing U.S. citizen in Ukraine, an American pastor believed to have been kidnapped by Russian forces. And his wife says she saw the whole thing go down. Gabe Gutierrez has that report from Lviv. Tonight, a U.S. citizen working as a missionary in Ukraine is missing. Dmitry Bodiu's family says he was abducted by Russian troops. What's going on exactly, we don't know. Bodiu, who often visited his father in Texas, is a well-known pastor in Melitopol, the same southern Ukrainian city where the mayor was kidnapped earlier this month and later released as part of a prisoner swap. We spoke with Bodiu's wife, Helen, over a spotty phone connection. She says she was in the house when 8 to 10 armed Russian soldiers came in. 
Well, they just came in, took our phones, gadgets, and took him somewhere, I don't know where. His daughter has not heard from him since Saturday. We're praying for him, and we're praying that he's strong. Her mother told her the Russians asked if her father was American. They just took him without, against his will. The day after the invasion, Bodiu had invited Ukrainians to seek shelter at his church. Russia says that they're not targeting civilians. This pastor is a civilian. Neri Duarte is a humanitarian aid worker in Ukraine, frantically trying to find Bodiu. It is hard, but uh, somewhere, somehow, humanitarian workers learn to, to, to cut themselves from, from the reality and just keep on going. Gabe joins us now from Lviv. Gabe, what is the State Department saying about this, and do we have any reason to believe this is part of a pattern or strategy by the Russians to abduct Americans inside of Ukraine? Well, Tom, the State Department says that, that it's aware of the reported abduction, but at this point can't comment because of privacy concerns. And usually that's what the State Department says, because if, and that's a big if, there are sensitive negotiations going on, they don't want to get in the way. Now, as to whether this might be part of a larger strategy by Russia, according to the family, they think, well, it might be possible he was targeted because he was American, or it could also be possible that because he was a well-known pastor in the area, the Russians decided to capture him because of that, because, as I mentioned in the piece, Tom, the mayor of that town was also abducted several weeks ago, and he was traded as part of a prisoner swap and later released. So it could be that the Russians are looking to capture this pastor to trade him for soldiers later on. But at this point, it's too soon to tell. All we know is that the family is desperate for answers at this point, Tom. Yeah, we hope he turns up somewhere. All right, Gabe Gutierrez for us. Gabe, thank you. Back here at home in the pain at the pump. As nationwide gas prices skyrocket, it, states are scrambling to help cut costs. NBC's national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has those details. As gas prices in many parts of California easily surge past 6 and toward $7 a gallon, tonight the state's governor wants Americans paying the most at the pump to see the biggest relief in their wallet. I'll be submitting a proposal to put money back in the pockets of Californians. If passed by state legislators, Gavin Newsom's new $9 billion proposal would give all state residents with a registered vehicle a $400 debit card, regardless of the car they drive or how much money they make. We would like to see the aid targeted to low and moderate income households, the people who are most negatively affected by rising prices. While critics contend Newsom's plan doesn't adequately help those most in need. Instead of just arguing about who's to blame for it, we decided to uh, take immediate action. Governors in three states, including Maryland, have already suspended state gas taxes. And while some lawmakers on Capitol Hill also propose suspending the federal gas tax, taxes only account for 15 percent of the cost of a gallon. The gas tax is a minor component of the final price of gasoline. It is not the majority of the cost. Miguel joins us now from our studios in Los Angeles. Miguel, how is the $400 debit card idea playing out in California with inflation already so high? Yeah, Tom, well, drivers here are looking for any break they can get. Remember here in Southern California, gas prices are at or getting very close to $7 a gallon. People are looking for relief, especially with inflation driving up costs everywhere. In California, as we get ready to switch over to those cleaner burning summer blends, we always see a gas price increase around this time of the year. But many say the cost to fill up now is just breaking the bank. No, it really is. I can't imagine what it's like in California. We see that graphic right next to you with those high gas prices. You live there. You drive every day. It's sort of part of the culture of California. What are people doing to get by? I'm curious. Well, a lot of folks here are taking some of those tips experts have long recommended. They're, con uh, they're consolidating trips when they can. Some folks are even cleaning out their trunks, trying to lighten the load in their cars and making sure their tire pressure is right to optimize gas mileage. And for those who can, they say they'll continue to work from home as long as they can. Tom? People are doing anything they can to beat these gas prices. It's out of control. All right, Miguel, thank you. We want to turn to the weather now. That storm system that caused that monster EF3 tornado in New Orleans wreaking havoc in the southeast. 
Severe winds heavily damaging and destroying homes in Virginia and South Carolina, ripping off roofs, downing trees and power lines, leaving thousands in the dark. I want to get to NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman now for more on this track. Michelle, these storms have just not let up lately. I know we've been tracking this since Monday, so we are on day four. We're continuing to track this cold front moving ever so slowly out the coast. But talking about that tornado, we it, the data officially came in and it is the strongest tornado to hit that area. The last one was 2017, had winds of 150 miles per hour. This one had 160 miles per hour. So as we look at the storm system now, we are finally saying for the first time in four days, we are not tracking any watches or warnings. That's the good news. Still remains a really big system with some embedded thunderstorms, some embedded rain. So we're going to continue to watch this as we go throughout the evening and overnight hours. As we move off to the north, we even have some cold air on the backside of this. So spring snow in spots. We have a heavy wet snow in Maine, and we're going to have more snow tomorrow also in the upper Great Lakes. Now we do have the chance. This is from the Severe Prediction Center for some embedded thunderstorms with winds gusting to 60 miles per hour as we go throughout this evening, mainly in southern Virginia, northern uh, North Carolina, and parts of Florida, central Florida. So as we go throughout time here, we're going to finally say goodbye to this cold front. We're going to see that rain lingering tonight. And then that wintry mix in parts of England with the heavy wet snow, also some ice. And then a secondary cold front's going to come through tomorrow. That's going to bring more snow from Minnesota to Maine. So winter is still not over yet there. But this is a big story, too. Look at that jet stream so far dipped to the south. So letting in that cold Canadian air while out west, they are feeling like summer with some temperatures in the 80s and 90s. By this week in Las Vegas, Tom, it's going to feel like 90 degrees. Back now with a 21 year old woman who was under arrest for allegedly killing two state troopers and a pedestrian while driving drunk on a highway. The tragedy happening just moments after those two officers had stopped the driver. Law enforcement and families now mourning those deaths. Juan Venegas has the details. Tonight, this woman behind bars accused of driving under the influence and killing two Pennsylvania state troopers. Now new details emerging that only add to the horrific tragedy. Yeah, it looks like a trooper might be down. Uh, they're doing CPR only right now. The officers fatally struck on the road early Monday morning as they helped a man walking on the highway. That pedestrian killed two. At least three, three down radio. Uh, one trooper, two troopers down. The Philadelphia district attorney now charging the woman accused of third degree murder and a DUI charge, adding she had just been pulled over by the same officers for a traffic stop. They were doing a car stop trying to get an arrest. On the, north, on the south side. That stop cut short as they responded to calls about the man on the highway. The impact taking place when they were walking him back to their vehicle. Did you see the troopers in front of you, man? 21-year-old Johanna Tanay Webb is the accused driver. Webb has been denied bail and remains under arrest. The troopers killed been identified as 33-year-old Martin Mack III and 29-year-old Brandon Siska, the pedestrian 28-year-old Reyes Oliveras. The district attorney additionally releasing details in court stating the driver admitted drinking cognac prior to the crash. Her attorney asking for her release with a tracking monitor before trial. Number one, she's not a flight risk. Number two, she's not a danger to society. This wasn't an intentional act. Right? We're not talking about a capital case here. We're not talking about a murder one case. We're talking about uh, a potential, potentially an accident that happened, that people were involved in a confluence of unfortunate events that culminated into this horrific accident. Yet, it will be up to a judge to decide as the investigation takes place and the families of the victims plan their funerals. All right, Gua joins us now. Gua, speaking of those victims there, the family of the pedestrian who was walking on the highway has now spoken out about the incident. Uh, yes, Tom. So uh, they are from Puerto Rico, and first they say they plan to have his funeral services to take place there. Now, the victim's sister says they have no idea why he was walking on the highway that night. Now, interestingly enough, the mother also says she forgives that driver. Uh, the charged driver expected to remain in jail and uh, has a hearing early next month in court. All right, back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we have to start with this video, that violent attack on a Southwest Airlines employee in Atlanta. 
New cell phone video shows the man walking over to a gate attendant and punching him. You see him right there, punching him in the face. Authorities say the man was acting aggressively while his flight was taxiing, forcing it back to the gate. That man reportedly kicked off the plane before attacking the employee. He's now facing battery and obstruction charges. Now to the fire breaking out at the Mile High Stadium in Denver. Smoke seen billowing out of the top of the stadium. Firefighters battling those flames in one of the arena's suites and an upper seating deck. That arena, the home of the Denver Denver Broncos, of course, for more than two decades. No injuries have been reported, and it's still unclear exactly what caused all this damage. An update tonight, the driver who ran over a man while doing donuts in New York City has been arrested. You may remember we brought you this video earlier in the week. Police say 22-year-old Tyler Greer is the driver caught on camera performing stunts before hitting a man that was near the vehicle. The victim suffered a fractured skull, brain injury, and severe trauma to the body. Greer is now facing multiple charges, including assault. And March for Our Lives today with a grim protest in Washington. The group formed after the 2018 shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, laying out more than 1,100 black body bags on the National Mall, each one representing more than 150 people killed by gun violence since Parkland. Those bags also spelling out the words thoughts and prayers. The group demanding stricter gun control legislation from Congress. All right, we want to turn back now to our coverage from Ukraine, where the war is prompting people from around the world to help join in the fight. In Lviv, vital military aid is being delivered by groups of foreign volunteers. NBC's Cal Perry met with one man who was inspired to help Ukraine after seeing a report on NBC's Nightly News. Tonight, foreign volunteers flocking to Western Ukraine, doing their part to support the war effort. So, like, this is my backyard. I mean, I'm not going to let these guys in here, no matter what. The city of Lviv, largely spared by the war, remains the country's connection to the outside world. It's where you'll find Jonas Oman. He's a Swedish-Lithuanian who, with his motley crew, is supplying millions of dollars in military gear to Ukrainian soldiers. It's the body armor, and in this case, 30 pieces, helmets, for knees, for elbows, high-end rifle scoops. If it seems surreal, that's because it is a man with many vans, and a bus filled with the tools of war. The group calls themselves Blue and Yellow. Named after the national flag of Ukraine, Jonas says their funding comes chiefly from independent donors. Jonas and his friends formed the group in 2014 when Putin's Russia invaded Crimea. I was terrified because he's coming. I'm living in Lithuania, so he's coming to me. The next stop will be Baltics. Their chosen weapon is logistics and they've managed to funnel funds and material from across Europe into this war zone. This is really the anatomy of a supply chain, how to win a war. These flak jackets came from Poland two days ago. This van came across the border late last night, and this morning they're loading it into these pickup trucks. This one is headed east to the city of Kharkiv. In some cases, Jonas and his team even take custom orders from individual soldiers over text message. Jonas, <laughs> I need a rifle scope, this and that, and they send me a link. And okay, good, fine, you have it. Their mission has spurred others to join up. We spoke with one man, an American citizen, who said he was inspired to come to Ukraine while watching NBC's nightly news. And I was literally just foaming, like steaming and drinking beer in my recliner. Your recliner where? Where was your recliner? Milwaukee. In Milwaukee. Yeah, watching Lester, Hel uh, Lester Holt. <laughs> and they're also supplying more modern tools to fight a truly 21st century war. In 2015, we understood this is going to be a drone war. So we have provided, I don't know, hundreds of these to the various, you know, for fire correction, for reconnaissance, for, for, for dropping presents. Presence, as in bombs on Russian soldiers, a dark joke for a dark time in Ukraine. All right, Cal Perry joins us now live from Lviv tonight in Ukraine there. You know, Cal, I have to ask you, I mean, these foreign fighters, if you will, at least foreign suppliers, they seem dedicated to the cause. Did they tell you, did they express any desire to fight the Russians? And will they stay there until they see Russian forces approaching? So this group is not going to actually go to the front and fight the Russians themselves. They're interested in supplying that front, though we have met foreign fighters, including some Americans, who say they are willing to go to the front. And listen, the Ukrainian government has a website. You can go, you can sign up, you can become part of the Foreign Legion. It is why there are now thousands of foreign fighters here on the ground, Tom. All right, Cal Perry tonight with that up-close look at the supply chain.
to assist the Ukrainian forces by groups from all over the world. Cal, we thank you for that report. And now UNICEF says more than half of all Ukrainian children have been displaced by this war. Think about that. With 1.8 million crossing into neighboring countries as refugees, and since the start of Russia's invasion, at least 7,000 babies have been born. NBC's Dasha Burns has more in Poland with the most vulnerable victims. Song time is a highlight of the day for these kids. They're orphans who fled to Poland with their caretakers. Among them, 15-year-old Leah. We're withholding her last name. This is the second time Leah has fled conflict in Ukraine. In 2014, she escaped violence in the east. Now, eight years later, retreating west again. Many Ukrainian orphans like Leah are deemed social orphans. They have living parents unable to care for them. My mom in Mariupol. And my dad in Kiev was my brother. And uh, it's hard. I don't know what happened with my mom. Uh, if she died or... The 5th of March is the last time you talked to your mom? Mm-hmm. Yes. Do you know where she is now? Ukraine has one of the largest orphanage systems in Europe, caring for almost 100,000 children, according to UNICEF. The agency also warns that children fleeing war are at heightened risk for trafficking. It's a concern for Mykola Saharov, the director of Leah's orphanage. It's a big danger, he says. It's why they've registered all the children with the Ukrainian embassy here in Poland. Ukraine is among the top countries for U.S. adoptions, according to State Department data. It's where American Wendy Farrell found her daughter. She then started a nonprofit to support this orphanage and flew here when the war broke out. What's it been like to watch these kids go through all of this? Our kids are very resilient, but it is traumatic. She's working to bring them to the U.S. I don't want them to be lost in the shuffle. But the U.S. consulate is backlogged, and Ukraine has expressed concern about moving children out of Europe. For Leah, America would be a dream come true, but her heart is with Ukraine. Leah says she feels pain whenever she plays her favorite song. It's called Pray for Ukraine. She hopes the world will. All right, Dasha joins us now from Shushov, Poland tonight. Dasha, you know, we've been reporting about the orphans in Ukraine for weeks now, and part of the problem is because of the war, the adoption process has been slowed down. Adoption officials don't want to cut any corners that may invalidate that adoption later on. Are you getting any sense that they're trying to get a hold on this because there are so many parents in the U.S., but really across the world that want to help out right now? Yeah, Tom, so many Americans want to in some way be a part of this effort to help refugees, particularly children. And uh, Ukraine is one of the top countries where Americans adopt children from. Uh, but right now, Ukraine has put adoptions on hold. And that's because the top priority at this moment, Tom, really is the safety of these kids. And UNICEF has warned that uh, in times of war, children are extremely vulnerable to child trafficking. In this sort of chaos, this large-scale movement of people that we're seeing right now, especially of children, there are groups out there that will try to take advantage of that. And so right now, the idea is just to keep these kids as safe as possible. So Ukraine has really been concerned about having these children move out of Europe. So right now, again, safety is the top priority, and there are still children coming in every day. In fact, uh, just a couple of hours ago, I spoke to someone from UNICEF who said that 7,500 children have actually been born into this war on top of that one in two kids in Ukraine that is now displaced. There are so many children in precarious situations right now, Tom. And that number will continue to grow. Okay, Dasha, thank you for that. Now to top stories, Global Watch and the new video in the murder investigation of a British official. Body cam footage showing police pinning the suspect to the ground during his arrest. Officers also heard screaming at him to drop a knife. He's charged with the fatal stabbing of David Amis, a member of the British Parliament, while he was visiting with constituents last October, the alleged attacker also facing terrorism charges. North Korea testing a banned missile as nuclear talks stall with the West. Japan and South Korea reporting the North fired an intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time since 2017. Japanese officials say the weapon is capable of reaching the east coast of the U.S. 
White House officials condemning the launch and reportedly agreeing to consider sanctions along with Japan and South Korea. And severe flooding drenching parts of Paraguay. Footage showing several roads in the capital city of Asuncion submerged. Cars sep swept away. Residents also attempting to flush out water out of their businesses and homes. In 2019, widespread flooding in the country forced 40,000 people to evacuate. All right, we want to take a look now at the intersection of education and politics in America. Tonight's Meet the Press reports takes a closer look at the front lines of the classroom battlefield in Florida. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow went to Brevard County, which is east of Orlando on the coast, to learn more about the contentious school board meetings that have at times turned into explosive affairs. At one point last October, the board chair even had to kick the entire audience out. In this county, some of the most vocal are the members of Moms for Liberty, founded by a former school board member, Tina Deskovich, who lost her seat after running against masking in schools. They say they're standing up for parental rights. Here's just some of what the Democrat who beat her, Jennifer Jenkins, had to say. I believe their political strategy is to create chaos um, and divide and get people engaged through fear. Uh, they had a Jennifer Jenkins has drawn fire as an outspoken liberal school board member in Brevard County. This political rhetoric about mask wearing is more important to them than supporting the funding of a fire department CPE program in Palm Bay. The incumbent you beat, Tina Deskovich, she then went on to found Moms for Liberty. Do you think in some way you prompted that to happen? Oh, a hundred percent. I jokingly apologize to people for that, um, that I gave her the position and opportunity to create that organization. After school board debates about masking policies and about the rights of LGBTQ students, protesters showed up outside her home. Hell no! They were screaming that my husband is a pedophile, uh, that I'm a pedophile, that I'm a child abuser. They were screaming curse words at people who were walking their dogs and pushing baby strollers. When I was reading my daughter a bedtime story and she legitimately asked me, Mommy, when are these mean people going to leave? Are they going to be back tomorrow? I just became infuriated. The next morning, plants in their yard were chopped down and the letters F.U. were burned into the grass. Moms for Liberty says they had nothing to do with that. Those were not their members. Do you believe that? I believe you can't strike a match and light a fire and claim that you have nothing to do with that wildfire. And with that, Kate Snow joins us now. Kate, this is such a wild snapshot of what's happening, not only there in Florida, but really across the country yeah. with so many school boards. I'm curious, you know, is Liberty, Moms for Liberty, excuse me, is that the only group or are there other groups on the right and groups on the left? Yeah, it's interesting. So Moms for Liberty, you heard the origin story there. That is the biggest group on the right. But then in response to them, you had another group form on the left called Families for Safe Schools. And, and originally they were really about safety in the co period of COVID, but now they've expanded into other things. The whole dialogue, the debate has expanded into a lot of other issues. Um, but it is interesting. Moms for Liberty now is all over Florida, Tom, and in 34 states, whereas Families for Safe Schools on the left, they told me they have a budget of zero right now. So they're not really as, they have as many members in the county, but they're not as big nationally. You know, Kate, I got to ask you, I know you're, you're a mom, uh, I'm a dad, and it's interesting, sometimes in these fights, they, they claim the kids are the catalyst for organizing like this, but you, you tend to forget about the kids when you hear about all the back and forth, and then other issues come up as well. Is there, is there any reason do we know why these issues have morphed into such a massive debate right now across the country? Well, I also think, Tom, that sometimes issues that pop up, say, in Texas or Pennsylvania, then end up in Brevard County, right? So... Um, what, what, what Jennifer Jenkins would say, the Democrat that you just heard from, from the school board, she would say that this is actually not all coming organically from Brevard. It's coming from other parts of the country, for example, wanting to uh, limit certain books in libraries. The night we were there, that's what they were debating, whether to pull books with quote unquote offensive content off of library shelves in the public schools. It's a big debate there, but I think it came from somewhere else. The, the list of books that Moms for Liberty was using was one that had been generated on a national scale. So it's really interesting, uh, the intersection between parental interests and education interests and politics. And we're in an election year, Tom. Yeah, Kate, and you always, you know, you, you want parents to be involved. You want parents to be able to have a say in how their kids learn. But at the same time, you don't want people's, 
yards being burned with F you yeah. if they're members of the school board. All right, Kate Snow, we look forward to this. You can watch the full episode, Classroom Culture Wars, when Meet the Press reports returns to NBC News Now tonight at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Again, a fascinating look at what's happening in this country. And coming up, Royal Reckoning. Prince William and Kate met with protests and calls for reparations as they arrived in Jamaica. The country now calling for independence, how the royals are responding. Stay with us. And we are back now with the Americas. Stories from the U.S. and across Latin America. Tonight, Prince William and Kate on their first overseas trip since the pandemic began, but they're not being met with warm welcomes. Instead, Caribbean countries are calling for independence and reparations. Here's Zinclay Esamwa. Tonight, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge on a week-long tour of the Caribbean, greeted not by pomp and circumstance, but protest. Our goal is to loosen and remove the hands, the gloved hands of the Queen from around our necks so that we can breathe. Now, Jamaica's Prime Minister, Andrew Holness, tells Britain's monarchy the country wants out. true ambitions as an independent the unexpected move from Jamaica, a Commonwealth country, came on Wednesday. Queen Elizabeth uh, is the head of state. Prime Minister, head of government. Queen Elizabeth, the head of state. The trip started with dancing. The royals intended to strengthen relations between the crown and Caribbean nations. William and Kate are the future of the monarchy. Yes, Charles is next in line in terms of um, succession, but it's William and Kate who really take the monarchy into the modern era. But now demonstrators have firm demands. We demand an apology and reparation. Prince William addressed these concerns. That the appalling atrocity of slavery forever stains our history. I want to express my profound sorrow. But that statement, critics say, stop short of an apology. Reparations, two dimensions. Uh, an actual apology, but also is there any programmatic form of compensation. William echoed the sentiments of his father, Prince Charles, in Barbados last fall. Barbados removed Queen Elizabeth as its head of state November of last year, but ceremoniously remained part of the Commonwealth. Now, Jamaica is echoing the call for independence. What changed? Really, it was with George Floyd. It was with that moment in which then there was a catalyst. A catalyst now putting into question the status quo of a centuries old institution. Having this play out um, directly in front of William and Kate um, really begs the question is, you know, is this enough? And, and what is the future of the Commonwealth? Okay, Zinclay joins us now. Zinclay, you know, with these royal trips, you have to think that there was an advanced team. You have to think that there were people on the ground, people briefing the royal family. And yet this entire trip has been a disaster. Do you think they had any idea this was going to happen? Yeah, Tom. So this trip to the Caribbean is actually part of the Queen's 70th Jubilee. It was intended to be a goodwill tour, but experts say Queen Elizabeth is aware that public sentiment around the royals is shifting. It's worth noting that William is not next in line to the throne, right? His father, Charles, is. However, the Queen chose to send William and Kate instead of Charles, Charles and Camilla. So experts say that move signals that the royal family is aware that this is a sensitive and potentially pivotal time for determining the future of the monarchy. Tom. All right, Zinclay Esamwa for with, with what has been a very rough week for the Royals. Zinclay, thank you. When we come back, ready to dance, the Razorback super fan getting to cheer his team on in the Sweet 16, but thanks to the generosity of strangers, one very special person will join him. That story next. Finally tonight, a very special story. A University of Arkansas student who happens to be blind is having his dream come true, cheering on his team in a Sweet 16 basketball game. And thanks to the generosity of other fans, his dad, who serves as his personal play-by-play -play announcer, will also get to go. For University of Arkansas sophomore Cole Phillips, Nothing beats the sound of cheering on the Razorbacks from the student section. Being at the game itself um, is just so much better, in my opinion, because you get to kind of feel that energy 
of the stadium. Cole, an Arkansas basketball super fan, is blind, but that hasn't discouraged him from showing up and cheering loudly for the Hogs this season. The Auburn game was crazy. I was in the third row of the student section for the Auburn game, and so it was awesome. Before he joined the student section, Cole had been attending basketball games with his dad, Brent, for years. His dad, a fellow Razorback, serving as a personal play-by-play -play announcer. So I really uh, missed the opportunity and the time that we had uh, when he was in high school. To... We went to everything. And although he admits it's not the same without his father there, he hasn't missed a game, listening to them from his dorm room. I'm very vocal, even when listening to the radio. I was at my... Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm like chanting defense, even though nobody can hear me. It's just me like alone in my dorm room. Defense. Defense. It's that defense that has propelled the Hogs to the Sweet 16, facing off against the number one seed Gonzaga in San Francisco. It's the kind of moment Cole had been saving up for, but he didn't want to go alone. Love going with my dad, being my play-by-play -play guy, but of course it's way too expensive for us both to go. So Cole started a GoFundMe, asking other fans to help his dad go to the game. The GoFundMe just took off. In less than a day, their trip was fully funded, an anonymous donor giving them two tickets to the game. Oh my gosh, I mean, it's indescribable. I mean, it's about, I went from having no spring break plans to the best spring break I've ever had. <laughs> now dad and son back together again and ready for the big dance. Wow, I am in San Francisco. Just as a father, um, getting to see him so excited is, is such a joy. You think and I'm so, excited? We're going to have fun. We've had a ton of fun getting here, and we're just uh, feel blessed. Yeah. An amazing father and son experience. We thank Colin Brent for sharing their story. We thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.